Hello, everyone, and welcome to Democracy Cast. This is Dean Edwards with another weekly press briefing from Democracy Watch News. Today we have myself, John Harvey in Pittsburgh, and Mark Taylor Canfield in Seattle. I'm reporting to you from Salem, Oregon at our corporate studios for Democracy Watch News. Lately, I've been talking a lot about John Locke on the Second Treatise on Civil Government. There's one little special item in there that I'd like to focus on because it comes up a lot, and but not directly. I want to talk about slavery. During the 17th and 18th centuries, there was an old tradition which was maintained that relates to slavery called, about a just war. This is an issue that came up during the Middle Ages because the nobility in Europe and the aristocracy around Europe were, had a great passion for killing each other off or fighting each other, sometimes to great violence. And that violence affected the common people and it affected the people who were doing well in agriculture and that affected the church coffers, don't get me wrong. The donations to the church were affected by casualties and disrupting the local economies and they weren't gonna put up with that. They developed a concept of a just war. And there's a lot of ecclesiastical history, religious law, what in Islam they call Sharia, by the way, that's religious law. That law slowly gets transformed over to civil law, to the courts and the kings and the princes and dukes, etc., counts, all of that. The concept of, of a just war is important because by the 17th century, to put somebody into slavery was rapidly becoming a feature of a just war. Under no other circumstances, by the end of the 17th century was slavery a valid institution if you were not thrown into slavery as a result of a just war. This raises a lot of issues for a lot of practices, just like in today's world, of how people were expected to conduct themselves, how governments were expected to conduct themselves. And because governments, according to Locke, exist in a state of nature, that is, they're sovereign unto themselves and have not surrendered that authority to a, a, a commonwealth as citizenry and subjects of a king, for instance, do. It became just untenable that, that, uh, that the institution of slavery was illegally instituted and governments did what they do today. They chose on a, on a government by government basis to violate the international convention that it existed at the time. This lays a lot of problems for European and American history, the Atlantic slave trade. Uh, a lot of times they did not know the circumstances of somebody was enslaved. They just made the purchase and off they went with their contraband cargo, many of whom died in the passage. So that's my little report today from Salem, Oregon. It's really important that we encourage people to read the second treatise on civil government. You could read it out loud in four and a half hours. It's not that long a read. I do recommend you get a hold of uh, Locke, L-O-C-K-E. It's English after all. You, a very short introduction by Oxford University Press. It puts him in context. And John Locke in his writings informed Rousseau. He had an interesting dialogue of sorts indirectly with Mr. Hume, who was talking about stability and authoritarian government structures and royal structures. The goal was stability. So I wanna encourage people to read the second treatise on civil government. You'll find that it answers a lot of the questions we still have today that are at the foundations of our constitution. And maybe sometime we'll talk about abortion and property rights because Locke indirectly has some things to say about that as well. This is Dean Edwards in Salem, Oregon with Democracy Watch News. And John Harvey has our technology report and Mark Taylor Canfield will be following up from Seattle. Mark has been attending, attending a, a Reuters event that 
relates to press freedom and 21st century journalism. So Mark's gonna be giving us an update on some aspect of that from the Reuters event. Meanwhile, once again, John, I really appreciate these weekly technology updates. You always cover interesting items. What do you have for us today? Thank you, Dean. Well, you know, as you say, um, abortion is definitely going to be an interesting topic as the Supreme Court is right now, I believe, looking at that issue. So I'm definitely interested to see how that turns out. But so I suppose that really doesn't have much to do with technology. Although it should, because medical technology, I think, has made abortion safer. And that is something that we definitely should consider when it comes to abortion. And I really don't want to go down this rat hole, but, you know, banning abortion brings us back to the days of the clothes hanger and, uh, you know, various other things. So, Anyway, back to real technology. It's been a, a relatively quiet week in the technology space. We've seen a, a few interesting things happen. Jack Dorsey of Twitter resigned and is going to put his time into his other company, which he's decided to rename from Square to Block. And I could also go into how weird that is for the next while, but I won't. The other little bit of technology news that I think we should cover today is buy now, pay later schemes have exploded. And that's probably due to the pandemic, people staying at home, looking at what they can buy from Amazon and others, but don't quite have enough cash in the bank to make that purchase. And so banks like Klarna, for instance, make it possible to purchase on Amazon using a three payment or other plan. And that space, as I said, has exploded. Microsoft recently tried to, um, thinking of a polite word for this, uh, you know, let's say just squeeze themselves into that space by actually making it part of the Edge browser, which came under a lot of flack. People felt that Microsoft was pushing the concept of buy now, pay later on people, which you know, if you look at the industry, as I said, it's exploded, but that doesn't mean that people in general are paying all their bills. And so, you know, I think we're going to see some fallout from that industry in the months to come. The other interesting thing, as I was talking about last week, is how AI or artificial intelligence is really making a you know, it's, it's finally like virtual reality. It's finally come to the point where it's a reality. And so, you know, this month we saw the first AI, well, not the first, there have been others, but probably the most famous AI is a better way of saying it, Botto, a AI artist that creates work of works of art, <clears throat> excuse me, and the art is then put up for um, NTF auctions, non-fungible token auctions. And Botto has now made its first million dollars at auction. And so, you know, we have this AI that is starting to make money. And so, you know, that in my mind, you know, really goes to the question of, you know, when are we going to start seeing AI starting to replicate and create instances of themselves which are perhaps smarter than the average human being. Another area that we've seen an increase in AI and robotics is restaurants in particular, because we're seeing a shortage of manual labor workers or people that are willing to work for little to nothing. Um, you know, waitresses, waiters do get good tips on occasion, but generally their base salary is extremely low. And so this is another area that we've seen robots start to shine. Last night, I ordered a pizza. Every month I indulge myself by getting a pizza, and I often wonder why after eating it, but that's another story altogether. 
But the pizza business is another business that is suffering from the lack of delivery people, the lack of cooks, et cetera. And so, you know, not only are we having robots deliver or act as waitresses and waiters in a restaurant and deliver food to tables, but we're having robots actually cook food. And the first pizza making robot is now working in two restaurants in the United States. And the robot, the pizza making robot can reportedly make 300 pies an hour. And so the bad news, and I'll end on that, is that if you're working in any type of profession that is repetitive, where something can be done to instructions, I predict that your position will be taken over by a robot slash AI within the next five to 10 years. Thank you. This is John Harvey from Democracy Watch News on technology. Back to you, Dean. And last I checked, Taylor Canfield was standing by for a live report. Mark has been attending a Reuters conference. I, correct me if I've got that wrong, Mark. And you have some updates in the world of journalism. Mark Taylor Canfield from Seattle, Washington. I want to unmute yourself, Mark. Yes, this is Mark Taylor Canfield. I'm uh, currently participating in the Reuters Next Conference, which is a virtual global conference, which is taking place December 1st through the 3rd. And it's bringing together global leaders and forward thinkers. And according to Reuters, the purpose of this is to inspire, drive action, and accelerate a new approach to the challenges we face in the year ahead. Uh, as we all know, the last two years have transformed the world in a way uh, which has never happened before and has really changed the way we understand business, markets, society, the environment, and technology. So according to Reuters, today a new thinking is required, and that's why this conference was organized. It involves representatives from over 100 countries. There are 150 speakers involved with over 100 live sessions. And some of the uh, speakers have included Anthony Blinken, the Secretary of State for the United States, uh, Yacinda Ardern, Prime Minister, or Ardern, uh, the Prime Minister of New Zealand, Janet Yellen, the Secretary of the Treasury for the United States, uh, Mia Motley, the Prime Minister of Barbados, uh, Joseph Stoltenberg, the Secretary General of NATO, John Kerry, the Special Presidential Envoy on Climate, for the United States, and also the Director General of the World Trade Organization, so uh, and Stacey Abrams, founder of Fair Fight Action, so among many others. So it's been concentrating on, on world leaders, and that actually has been one of my criticisms here, is that there are a lot of corporate people involved, you know, the, uh, the president for uh, uh, carbon emissions or for Chevron spoke, and a lot of the talk has been about profit and markets and capitalism. So uh, not quite as independent uh, as I would like to see it. There are a lot of voices out there that are not being invited to this conference. Um, but I do have to say that some of the sessions have been very interesting. The most important part and aspect, I think, of this conference has been the networking opportunities because it's uh, through the apps that are being used uh, to organize a conference. Uh, folks like me uh, with Democracy Watch News have been able to network with journalists and leaders of business uh, and science all, all over the world. So it's a great chance for someone like us or someone like me to invite some of those people to interact with us as an organization. We've, I've even had some conversations with uh, so-called angel investors uh, and other folks who are interested in startups. So it's been very interesting. Um, but at the same time, I believe that uh, I would like to see it change so that next time, the next conference, uh, would allow more time for interaction and conversation uh, amongst the participants, because unfortunately, some of the sessions have been pre-recorded, which reminds me a little bit of the, um, of the Facebook uh, conference on the metaverse that we ex experienced the Connect conference a while ago. A lot of it is pre-recorded, so there's not an opportunity to uh, interact directly with the speakers. 
Um, and as I said, there's also a lot of corporate leaders involved. So uh, there's a lot of talk about money, money, money here about profits. Um, there, there's been talk about the change in the banking industry, industry though, and uh, the introduction of cryptocurrency and other ways of, of reorganizing banking uh, in the world. But I did find that some of the uh, corporate representatives seem to be, and even some of the, uh, the reporters with Reuters who were doing the interviews, seem to be really concerned with increasing markets and increasing profits and the, the whole capitalistic system rather than what's really happening on the, on the grassroots level around the world. Um, but you know, it, there have been talks about transitioning from fossil fuels in the post COP26 era. Um, the representatives from Chevron said that they wanted to reduce their carbon emissions by 35% by 2028. I think we need to do better than that. Uh, there are a lot of talk about um, uh, subsecration. There are ways of dealing with carbon emissions that I think are, are not as serious as they probably should be. There's a lot of talk about, you know, pumping the carbon into the earth, which is uh, reminiscent of fracking. Um, and so I think there might be some issues here that need to be challenged actually. However, some of the sessions that I really enjoyed in, included uh, a session on the metaverse. Um, and that was very interesting to me because it is something that we're all looking forward to. And as a news reporter, I'm also looking forward to ways of interacting uh, using uh, uh, 3D and in interactive uh, platforms. There's, you know, there wasn't much talk about how journalism could use it, which I think is, was one of the failures of the conference. Um, but it was, it was interesting nonetheless in, in hearing what people have to say about what's been going on. Um, and as far as the metaverse uh, session, the chairman and co-founder of Anima, Animoca Brands, Natalie Johnson uh, was involved, Yat Sui, um, and some other folks, the co-founder of RTFKT. Um, but there, there was a lot of talk about markets and, and how uh, the metaverse could be used not only for organizing organizations like ours or the, the typical office. There was a, a separate session on you know, the new office organization, uh, the way that people are interacting online as we are today, rather than in physical spaces. And so that was also another interesting session. Uh, I think that um, some of the ideas that are coming out of this conference do need to be followed up on with other sessions. Um, it was interesting hearing from these global leaders, but I do believe that there are some, uh, emphasis, some emphasis that I personally would like to see in this conference and in, in, in my interactions with the organizers, I've made that clear. There needs to be more talk about increasing diversity in media. Um, there was one session today on that, but I think that that was one of, uh, one of the issues that was sort of left behind. There was an interesting session on the, the music industry, which I thought was interesting, except for the fact that once again, the speakers concentrated mainly on uh, the billions of dollars that can be made from streaming. I didn't really talk too much about the artists themselves. There was more talk about how to monetize, monetize, monetize. I've seen this over and over again throughout these sessions that uh, it's all about money, 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 money. And most of the speakers are very well connected uh, with very wealthy uh, corporate uh, entities or other international organizations that are, that are very, very well funded. So the people at this conference are talking about billions of dollars that are being uh, that's that are being exchanged across the world, and I would like to see a little bit more about what's actually happening in the average person's life, and a little bit less about what's happening in terms of international trade organizations like the WTO, which was also represented, um, and uh, other organizations that you know have clearly been in control of the markets and in. Uh, the sort of thinking that goes on on this planet in terms of uh, climate change. Um, the, some of the sessions that were most important to me had to do with democracy. And of course, Democracy Watch News, that's our focus. So there was a session with Stacey Abrams called Keeping American Dro Democracy Strong in the Face of New Challenges to Voting Rights. Uh, that was definitely an, a very interesting uh, conversation uh, with moderator Kanjanga Johnson, who is a financial regulation correspondent for Reuters. Once again, a financial regulation correspondent, you know, moderating a, 
a talk about democracy, but um, you know, there are a lot of Democrats in the United States say, members of the Democratic Party say that the opposition party, which is the Republican Party, is using tactics to seize power. And there was some criticism that Biden's White House and Congress are not fighting effectively ahead of the 2022 midterm elections and the 2024 national elections. Uh, Stacey Abrams talked about how effective get out the vote tactics can help counter these naked power grabs and the other initiatives that the uh, uh, Biden administration should employ. There was a lot of talk about consumer shock and disruption of markets around the world following the pandemic. Um, and then, you know, the problem with supply chains. Uh, and, you know, so some of, the, some of the discussions were very apropos. There was a lot of talk about hydrogen. However, um, there doesn't seem to be a, a move to directly address that issue as far as green hydrogen. There's a lot of talk about gray hydrogen and other forms of creating uh, power around the world that still involve uh, carbon emissions. So I think there needs to be a, a much more, I, I wish Greta Thunberg was a part of this conference so that she could really shake things up and let people know that it's great that corporations and world leaders are talking about the issue, but what are their concrete plans? Uh, I noticed that, uh, for instance, the representative of Chevron, when he was asked very uh, critical questions about uh, Chevron's policy towards climate change, he would <clears throat> clear his throat and seem to be a little bit nervous about his statements because he's representing billions of dollars of stockholders. One of the things he said was that they're not interested in solar power, that that's not really something that he thinks that Chevron uh, should be involved with. And he said that part of the reason for that is because that's the feedback from their stockholders. Um, once again, back to democracy though, and then I'll, I'll conclude this report. But there was another panel that I thought was really, really interesting called Defending Democracy Around the World because as we know in all regions of the world, democracy is facing uh, both traditional threats, which have been around for a long time and emerging threats. So uh, there was uh, a conversation with Gina Griswold, Secretary uh, of State for Colorado, who made some very, very important statements about democracy. She, I think, was one of the standouts. Um, the moderator for that session was Jeff Mason, who's the White House correspondent for Reuters. Um, but also James Glassman, the chairman and CEO of Glassman Advisory was part of that conversation. But I think Gina really told the real story here. And one of the quotes I left with that I will probably always remember is she said, electing uh, public officials and uh, politicians who lie to the public purposely is like appointing an arsonist to be the chief of your fire department. And I really believe that Gina uh, is doing the right thing in her state in in terms of mail-in voting and other issues having to do with democracy. This is Mark Taylor Canfield in Seattle at the Reuters Next Virtual Global Conference. Thank you, Mark. And this is Dean Edwards in Salem, Oregon for Democracy Watch News, including another episode of Democracy Cast weekly news briefings from Democracy Watch News. I want to thank you for joining us. You can listen to these episodes and our, and our various reports on TuneIn Radio or Stitcher. You can find them on your local podcast provider, uh, particularly Play Store and iTunes. We invite you to follow up, look at some of our previous episodes. An early one was even dealing with a journalist who was kidnapped and unfortunately later found dead. And we were one of the first people to interview his editor. That was one of our early broadcasts. We've been doing this for a long time now developing a lot of expertise, refining our style. And we invite you to listen to not only the current episodes, but also our past episodes. You'll find some rather interesting items that are essential to a good historical archive of this past decade. This is Dean Edwards for Democracy Watch News, inviting you to rejoin us once again for Democracy Cast. need it's incumbent upon you to uh, 